this, so I don't know where it came unusual lecture. It's a very usual, it's going to be very usual, so. <laughs> Uh, but it is true, they're gonna, I'm going to mention some nightmares. But one thing, it, speaking seriously, I'd like to, s to say at the beginning is that one of the things about the GVN I, that it, I, is, n I don't want to say it's unique, but it's unusual that people involved in acute virus disease meet with people involved with more chronic virus diseases. Now, HIV is an exception. It overlapped because of the horrible acuteness of it all and worldwide aspects. But for tumor viruses, it's very unusual that both, s the both sides get to really together like this. But we can't leave out any virus in, uh, or any virus type. That was the goal, to have expertise in all kinds of viruses. Uh, by the way, I have no idea what this is to the arrow. Changes it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'll use this one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, the side arrow to make it, or top arrow. Or the side arrow. Okay. Um, I wanted to start by going back to the 1970s, because there are people who weren't involved in virology in the audience at that time. And maybe this is known by everybody, but I don't think so. And maybe I've shown this slide to some of you before, and I'm sure of that. But the, the first one, this was a common statement. You would never say it today, because it wouldn't be very polite or accepted, but when I'm going to tell you what the conclusion of that is, therefore we can forget about it. It's only a problem for those people. That, I used to hear that a lot that the, the serious epidemic diseases are over in the industrial world, except for maybe studying them at uh, tropical disease institutes. And it was, we, let's say, mid-1970s. And if you want evidence for it, major departments of microbiology were closed, some of them in the United States, for example. Um, retroviruses don't infect humans, that's for sure. And there are many reasons for this. And I'm going to show you some evidence for that also. No <laughs> viruses or, or cancer is not caused by anything infectious. How naive could you be? Cancer is not catching, right? So this was really uh, tough. You want evidence for it? 1974 Cold Spring Harbor organized by Jim Watson and John Karen's conclusion. All cancer involves spontaneous mutations or chemicals. The chemicals sort of died a little bit. But uh, infectious causes were not even mentioned with or, or without a cofactor. So by the 1980s early, I put up these biases were destroyed. Viruses or infectious diseases in general are cause of about 20% of human cancers. Retroviruses were found in humans, caused some serious diseases. And then AIDS, of course, a powerful story with another retrovirus. Now I want to jump to the causes of cancer by infections. Only systemic. I won't mention Merkel cell carcinoma, but if you number them, EBV, papilloma 2, hepatitis viruses 3 and 4, Kaposi sarcoma, uh, HTLV1, and helicobacter pylori. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If you had Merkel cell, that would be 8. I have been highlighted in red something about HTLV1. Uh, you, that was a great talk by Antoine, a great review. So there's not much to, to really add to that. But this is something that Yutaka Tagaya and I, uh, who's here in the audience, published not so long ago, that the amount of cancer that HTLV-1 causes, or I shouldn't say the amount of cancer, the oncogenicity of it, is as far as we can tell greater than anything we know of. I mean anything. <laughs> Cigarette smoking, you name it. So it's more than any infectious cause. But so why isn't it more discussed, more on everybody's tip of their tongue? Because it doesn't transmit very well. And because very, it was very poorly funded, and when AIDS came along, most of us abandoned it. So it just simmered along until recently, that the tension we've been talking about. Okay, so uh, let me now go to some summaries about how HTLV-1 was found and how it impacted HIV. And then are there lessons for GVN in something like this? I don't think you could have prepared for it. It means you have to have expertise broadly because we wouldn't have been thinking of retroviruses, really, if we didn't have the experience with HTLV-1. So what I said here, these were the key things that led, the technical things that were key for the discovery of HTLV-1 and HTLV-2. We're using reverse transcriptase as a surrogate marker. But you can't just use it as a surrogate marker because there are cellular DNA polymerases. This is a DNA polymerase. So the, a big part of the 1970s, we spent on characterizing the cellular DNA polymerases, distinguish them from viral reverse transcriptases in a host of animal retroviruses by immunology and by biochemistry. And then came the homopolymers, 
these oligomeric and polymeric molecules that function as template primers that gave us very sensitive assays, three logs more than electron microscopy. And the value of this for human retroviruses, especially HCLV1, is that you can, you can assay as you go along in culture because the virus comes out in spurts. And e electron microscopy would never do it. It would be too insensitive. The virus is too low. And, it, and when you go in spurts, you get mostly negative results. And around that period of time, we were driven towards T cell malignancies or towards T cells because we had found the virus in gibbon apes. Of it, it had already been discovered by a Japanese-American Kawakami causing chronic myeloid leukemia, and we found one that caused T cell leukemia. But then we had found T cell growth factor, which is now called interleukin-2 or IL-2. It was an early cytokine, one of the earliest cytokines, but enabled us to grow T cells. And that's how you isolate human retroviruses and how they were, in fact, all isolated. This is the last slide I'm going to present about this, and I just summarize some notable aspects. So it's the first human retrovirus. It's the only leukemia virus. It causes a very fatal disease described by uh, Antoine uh, very nicely. Be, be, uh, and the disease, as he already noted, was discovered before the virus. It directly transforms its target cells. It immortalizes them, which can be useful in the laboratory setting to have immortalized CD4 T cells. You say, was that ever been practically used? We use it to discover that chemokines were natural inhibitors of HIV, which led to the finding of CCR5 as a co-receptor. It gave us insights into the mechanism of leukemogenesis, and it turns out to be completely different than we know for any animal retrovirus. In the very specifics, you get to the same place in the end, which is altered, D altered DNA and failure to have proper apoptosis of altered DNA cells. It can also cause central nervous system disease. Now, Antoine didn't say it, but he's the one who discovered it, not when he was with me, but when he was with Guy Dete, right, who came out of this region, out of Lyon. And they described this, in, I don't you know, I forget if it was a short paper in Lancet, I believe, and then Osami in Japan uh, confirmed it immediately thereafter. So that serious central nervous system disease is a spastic para, uh, paraparesis uh, that is called HDLV1-associated myelopathy. Now, it also causes immune disorders and inflammation. You heard about that already. The, the, for example, the situation in Australia where the, a lot of the people are getting seriously ill with bronchiectasis from chronic bacterial infections. Why they're more bacterial, HIV is more viral and fungal? We don't know because nobody studies this virus in terms of the mechanism of how it does things. Um, it provided impetus to search for other retroviruses. It led to the discovery of HDLV2 and the idea that HIV excuse me, that AIDS would be caused by a retrovirus, which Essex and I postulated in 1982. It also predicted the regulatory genes of HIV. It was the first time we saw regulatory genes in a retrovirus. We found that people found them later in bovine leukemia virus, SIV, STLV, et cetera. And it's more, I already said the carcinogenesis, and it's an important public health problem in places that he or already described. I want to make one last note about it in terms of HIV. This held us, this, this gave us our idea um, and then held us back for about six months to a year. Why? Because a young Frenchman who went to Haiti on his honeymoon had a car accident, like many people get when they go to Haiti, and he got blood transfused, and he got both HDLV1 and HIV. We get the sample, and we're feeling very confident. Well, this is exactly the hypothesis. It'll be HDLV1 reasonably related, a brother. And there were two viruses. Now, if you knew retrovirology at the time, they interfere with one with another. Therefore, there shouldn't be two. And we didn't have the technology to separate them out. So we're thinking, okay, this is the right thing, and we were using HDLV1 and HDLV2 reagents, antibodies, to go survey. And increasingly, they'd be positive because 5% are double infected. So, so that went on and really tormented us. But in the end, it also gave us a positive. And the positive was we recognized that you could grow HIV forever in an immortalized HDLV1 transformed cell. That allowed for the breakthrough. Uh, the breakthrough was the ability to grow HIV that you could make a blood test that really works and that you could send it to the world. So it had a positive aspect in the end for us. Now, the dogma filled the air too often at that time. I submitted the paper with the discovery of this virus, and uh, it gave us our ideas and background for the discovery of HIV, but it was uh, outright rejected by the Journal of Virology, more or less because they just told me it wasn't believed. And later, after human retroviruses were accepted, now let's jump to 1982, when Essex and I postulated AIDS was most likely caused by another human retrovirus, 
It was also criticized by scientists who said retroviruses don't cause immune deficiency. They accepted it for cancer, but not immune deficiency. But yet there is data that cat variants of cat leukemia virus cause immune deficiency. In the mouse leukemia virus, some variants cause immune deficiency. So the answer I and at the bottom of the slide for this kind of nonsense is to have science expertise in all types of virus in a joint force. In other words, something like the Global Virus Network. That's that's the uh, the letter that I received, and it made, it's a called the Dear John letter. If you were in the war, this was a Dear John letter. Dear Bob, go away. I mean, nobody wants you around, <laughs> and uh, you don't know what you're doing. And really, that nobody believes this. It's all nonsense. And so, and this paper was a complete paper. I sent him a long paper, which we we actually carved into four papers after that. <laughs> if it wasn't for the late Henry Kaplan, who spun, I w <laughs> was a time before the Academy, that at least that I was in it. <laughs> this is 1980 uh, mid. And Henry Kaplan reviewed our lab and said, I want to sponsor that for the P for PNAS. If it wasn't for that, I'd think we still probably be dropped. <laughs> so that was a rather critical moment in time. Now the new findings and uh, nightmares. And uh, so there are the two nightmares. It's not a virus, but a bacterium. And it's a hit and run. So let me hit and run or hit and hide, it, I should say. Think about <coughs> a hit and run mechanism. Let's say a woman is pregnant gets infected, right? You don't, you don't have to have much imagination for this. And then infects the embryo. And 20 years later, 30 years later, 10 years later, five years later, acute childhood leukemia, for example, maybe, the disease occurs. You go to look for something that's not there. What do you do? How can you prove that? That's really hard, right? But hopefully you can find a remnant of it. And I think that's what we're heading toward. So I want to tell you this story. It's going to be published next week in the Proceedings uh, U.S. National Academy of Science, so I, I can really I think safely talk about it in a summary form. So uh, if you're interested, that's it'll come out in about a week. Okay, so bacteria and cancer. You all know that there are a lot of claims today for bacteria and cancer, but other than Helicobacter pylori, there's never an animal model, never a mechanism really proven, and the associations are t reasonable, and somebody else will f report the same thing, but it never catches on, right? Uh, but so they said, but other than Helicobacter pylori, none are definitive, lacking mechanisms of animal models and sufficiently tight associations. And many other bacteria are not associated at all. I'm going to tell you what our hypothesis is based on the early data. That one major mechanism for the carcinogenicity of some bacteria depends upon a common gene with a highly related sequence. This is what's in this new paper. This came out of a study of some mycoplasmites. Now, how the heck do we get into mycoplasma? And it, I would wanted to look at mechanisms of some things that were happening that weren't related to the virus that I thought were going to be due to cytokines, and frequently we were coming up with mycoplasma, and it was having these effects. And so, you know, mycoplasma, is it a contaminant? We found it way too frequently in HIV-infected people. Then we found that it's, it is prevalent in HIV-infected people. Well, it's a common human infection, period. But very much so if you're immune deficient because it replicates much more. So anyway, to go on, here, I didn't, we have a slide with a lot of bacteria that have been linked to cancer. These are the ones that are more common in terms of mycoplasma. So mycoplasma infections in different human cancers is one paper. Mycoplasma in prostate is a common one. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. There's a lot of publications related to mycoplasma and human cancer. But, you know, the, the, you, the bacon doesn't come home. So, excuse me. I don't know what I just did. Do you know how to get that off there? Sorry, folks. Well, it's in our. Is it okay? Yeah, you got it. Yep. The next is a picture of a mycoplasma. I, I suspect you know what they look like, but I didn't. So, <laughs> so I show it for myself to remind me that this is doesn't have a cell wall. Very strange for a bacteria. So m many, maybe we shouldn't even call it a bacterium. And it's also pretty big, very widespread in nature, uh, and. Um, I said uncontrolled replication. It can be intracellular also, and that's going to be part of a hypothesis I'm going to leave you with at the end. So now an, associated, an association of disseminated mycoplasma fermentins in HIV-positive patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is another report that we became aware of, uh, and that's Ainsworth and his colleagues. He made it, he's from Oxford. He made a visit with us, and he published not a large number of cases, but by PCR he was identified in the serum of uh, patients with HIV infection who had lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So that turned us to the skid mouse model. 
I'm sure you're all familiar with the severe combined immunodeficient mouse model that can't repair double-stranded DNA breaks. The DNA, the DNA PK complex is screwed up, and so you can't make uh, the proper T cell receptors for T cells. We don't get the proper immunoglobulin rearrangements for B cells. Those cells die, and the mouse has almost no B cells and very few T cells. And that mouse, in time, if those, if those abnormalities continue, if you look to the right of the slide, eventually T53 gets mutated, and so you have the combination of DNA breaks without P53 activity. So what do you think happens? Well, of course, you get cancer. You get lymphoma. And that's only after a certain length of time. I think it's about 30 weeks or something like that. Oh, it's at the bottom of the slide, actually, right there. Yes, 30 weeks. There's a skid mouse model, uninfected by anything, not with mycoplasma, has normal P53 to begin with, but by 30 weeks it loses its P33 activity, P T53 activity, pardon me, and it develops lymphoma. If you just take a mouse without skid and have it P53 negative, it'll develop lymphoma in about 19 weeks. Oh, geez, I did it again. I'm sorry. I'm touching something that is going on. And then if you're P53 negative and a skid mouse, that's okay, you can leave that out. If you're P53 negative and a skid mouse, you get lymphoma in about 14 weeks. So now what if we just take a skid mouse and infect it with the mycoplasma? That's in red, just like the animal that is skid that is genetically made P53 negative. It gets lymphoma in about 13, 14 weeks, okay? So you can, if you look carefully at the slide, infected with skid, uninfected skid control, infected NSG mouse, and not viable mycoplasma, okay? We, now let me go back to this. We took mouse tissue from everywhere. At the beginning, it was easy to find mycoplasma. No problem. By the time the tumor develops, you can't find it anymore. It's a definitive hit and run because you know you put the mycoplasma in. It's got the tumor, 13 weeks, you look, you can't find it anywhere. Except if you really hunt for sequences, uh, we find over and over again that we can find a, a very, <coughs> very hard look, a fragment <coughs> that encode a, for a protein called DNAK. DNAK is a heat shock protein, HSP70 family of proteins. Looking with other probes, R1 through R5, we have uh, nothing except one or two uh, samples that were positive. T1, A, and B are two different tissue sources of an animal. T1, 2 versus 3 are three different animals. But always we could find some tissues that had scored positive for DNA K, particularly in the region 368 to 462. So, you know, what can we make of this? That's what's left. Is it left because of chance? Is it harder to digest? Or is it important in some way? So, hit and run or hit and hide. Mycoplasma was detected early in the mice, but only low copy numbers of mycoplasma with a DNA K, excuse me, a DNA K DNA sequences were found. That doesn't mean they're the only things there. That's all we could find. By the way, they, oh, I'll come back, excuse me, I got ahead of myself, I forget what I was gonna say. They were found in some primary tumors and then we, we transplanted these tumor cells to the next animal, to the next animal, and we find again that they develop the cancer and again it's ver this sequence is present in only very few cells, very hard to detect, and again, containing DNA K. So this, we suggest that at this point to ourselves, this points towards a hit and run or hit and hide mechanism of transformation. We also showed that the protein of DNA K is readily taken up by nearby cells. So it might be that a small number of cells carry this gene and gene product, but it can spread to a lot of other cells by rapid uptake, because it's rapidly released and rapidly taken up. So we just put that on the side. We're not going to go anywhere further with that at this point in time. Turning to the mechanism of how the mycoplasma induced lymphomas, the skid mo model itself and the following report from Russia suggested to us to focus on P53. The report from Russia was that mycoplasma infection suppressed P53, activated NF-kappa B, and cooperated with the oncogenic RAS in rodent fibroblast transformation. So we said, ah, oh, the skid mouse model, involves P53. This, in, this report suggests P53. So needless to say, we focus on P53. So we used anti-P53 monoclonal antibodies and did pull down an immunoprecipitate experiments 
I'm not going to show you the data for that. If you're really interested in this, please wait till next week and look at it. Uh, the identified proteins are shown here. Well, I put HSP70 family in red because that's DNA K. We had a reason, right? Because that's what we're finding in the tumor. Moreover, DNA K is far more interesting than, let's say, analase or arginyl tRNA synthetase family. So we have done nothing with the other things. So we focused on DNA K right off the bat. DNA K in P53. Now we looked in the literature and we found that the DNA K the, excuse me, DNA K from E. coli actually increased P53. So, gee, that's not in keeping with what we're looking for. However, in contrast, our data showed, and I won't go in details into this, but DNA K from mycoplasmic fermentin powerfully inhibits P53 function, the opposite of E. coli. Okay? So, mycoplasma DNA K, one, it directly impairs DNA repair. Immunoprecipitation analysis showed, I didn't show you this data, interaction with a complex of, pro of proteins involved in DNA repair, PARP1 and DNA PK, the protein kinase, that brings together the, very, the complex that is going to be involved in double-stranded DNA repair. Two, it indirectly reduces P53 activity. Again, I didn't show you this. It interacts with USP10. This is a protein which deubiquitinates P53. Now, you know, if you don't if you don't take off the ubiquitin molecule, this guy is headed uh, for what? It's going to be uh, going to the proteasomes and be destroyed, right? So in the, the US, when, you, when, you when you interact with USP10 and you present this, then you're, go you're going to lead to a reduced P53 uh, stability and presence. The downstream effects of diminished P53 include a reduction of these various molecules, PARP1 activity, P21, Bax, and Puma, and the last few are going to be the mediators of programmed cell death. When you know, everybody here knows, I'm sure, that when you have altered DNA, you want your P53 very active because you want to die. You want that cell to die or at least to be stopped for a while and not dividing anymore. So this has the opposite effects. You don't have the P53 functioning. So the result, you have impaired DNA repair, and apoptosis of DNA-altered cells is ineffective. Both are carcinogenic mechanisms. The last point I want to make on this is that mycoplasma infection reduces the activity of the anti-cancer drugs Nutlin from Roche and 5-FU. And it does that because what does Nutlin do? Nutlin interferes with, M with something that's the normal inhibitors of P53, MD1 and MD2. M MD, MD, M M2, MD, M1, pardon me. Those things bind P53, and Nutlin binds more effectively, so they can't bind, so P53 is activated. The mycoplasma infection interferes with that and interferes with the 5-FU uh, anti-cancer effects as well. What's shown in red in the bar graph is the greater cell proliferation when you're mycoplasma infected. So we, we think that this could be immediately clinically important. The data demonstrate to us that mycoplasma DNA K interacts with proteins involved in DNA repair, hampers cellular P53 function. In addition to these pro-carcinogenic effects, the mycoplasma infection of cells also results in resistance to anti-cancer drugs that are dependent on P53. Now, this is the beginning of the study where we're doing phylogenetic sequencing of this gene in various bacteria. If you look to the right side, you can see that where the mycoplasma sequence of DNA K is located. Around it, close to it, Helicobacter pylori, F nucleatum, which is frequently associated with colon cancer, um, the chlamydia, which is associated with several human cancers, and on the other far away is E. coli. And as we continue this, we see that the sequences of DNA K that are far removed from the sequence of mycoplasma have no association with cancer. Okay, so that, that's kind of where we are now and what is in the paper. In mycoplasma-induced lymphoma of mice, the mycoplasma DNA is found only in a very small number of tumor cells. Preliminary studies indicate similar sequences are found in some human tumors and in very few cells again and also include the DNA K gene. Now, uh, what do I, I, I really want to say that even though I'm going to show you this data, 
we didn't publish it. I don't want to make any claims in human until I understand how this DNA survives. We can't prove it's integrated. We did it, we proved it in one, and then we tried about eight more and we couldn't prove it. So is it surviving because it resists the DNA degradation more so than the rest of the sequence? Why is it surviving more? So that remains an enigma, but what I can tell you that is uh, very powerful that it's not any contaminant from the mouse tumor, definitively, we a completely different area of working, but beyond that, the sequence in the human tumors is different than the mouse. However, its mutations allow it to be translated in human cells. So the mouse sequence, uh, it's the mycoplasma sequence, which is in the mouse, and the mycoplasma sequence per se can't be translated in human cells. There, I don't even remember the amino acid right now, I think it's phenylalanine. There's mutations that allow that amino acid to be changed to allow translation to occur. And that's been found every time we look. It may be different mutations, but it gets to be a translatable DNA case. And this is the survey that we did of lymphomas and of normal tonsils. In normal blood, we find it only in maybe 5% <coughs> or something like that. But in tonsils, it's very frequent. So how often does it become systemic? The, the lymphomas that we found it mainly in were diffuse large B cell lymphomas or germinal center types, of five out of six. But again, I didn't want anybody to go away thinking we're making any claim on that. We did not, we, we, we thought hard about this and we said we're not publishing it until we can uh, look at this in two or three different ways, actually to try to disprove it. So, yeah, how does it, I already said that, how does it persist? I don't know. So that's, that's the problem. In summary, a bacterium capable of intracellular infection, a type of mycoplasma fermentans, related to incognitive strain, I didn't tell you that, infects mouse and human lymphocytes and produces lymphoma in the skid mouse. This we can say. No evidence of the mycoplasma is found after tumor development except for small, less than 1 kb DNA fragments in a very small number of cells. The fragment includes a component of DNA K, the protein of which markedly reduces pro-apoptotic P53 activity and interacts with proteins of the DNA repair complex. The protein also impairs the anti-cancer drugs dependent upon P53 enhancement. Exogenous DNA K protein can be rapidly taken up by nearby cells. The same fragment, but with variable limitations, identical to that found in the mouse, has been discovered in some human lymphomas and the fragment has mutations allowing its translation in human cells. But I really, uh, you know, this, I made this slide a while back. That last point I would really like to put with question mark, question mark, until we understand it. DNA K from cancer associated bacteria are similar. DNA K reduces the same anti cancer cellular pathways affected by oncogenic viruses. The paper is D. Zella et al. in press. Mycoplasma promotes malignant transformation in vivo. The DNA, its DNA K has pro oncogenic properties. DNAS. So, this is the last of any slide to say anything before an acknowledgement. And next, the hypothesis and predictions. A mycoplasma protein DNA K can foster cancer development. It does so by impairing DNA repair and reducing P53. Several other bacteria have very similar DNA K sequences. Most of these bacteria uh, are associated, excuse me, are associated with different human cancers, but no evidence of mechanism or convincing causality. Then I double starred that we have preliminary data for this. These bacteria with similar DNA K that are carried by a chronically infected human or uh, maybe um, also, but not necessarily, having an intracellular presence, that would seem to be the ones that would be most likely to be important. Intracellular presence, at least sometimes, frequently infecting humans or carried by humans all the time, can cause cancer and can diminish the eff efficacy of some anti-cancer drugs. That's the hypothesis, and that's what we're submitting grants for. It's, there's a, I feel that when you mention a lot of names, then no one gets ever acknowledged. So, you know, I try to keep it at a minimum. The important collaborator is Hervé Tedlin, who comes from France, actually, and he's working in uh, Claire Fraser's Institute, the Institute of Genomic Sciences at the University of Maryland. Uh, he was key, and David Zella, uh, well, David and I talk about every day of the week and then three times a day sometimes. So, and the rest of the people gave some critical help periodically. So, I believe 
that's the last slide. Yeah, thank you.